want to thank all of you for being here today. This is the first Tuesday at the Metro Archives. I'm Ken Feith. If you're watching from home, thank you. I appreciate your watching our show, watching the first Tuesdays. Um, today we're going to have a really, really special one. Family history is, uh, it's, it's evolved so much over time and it's amazing the resources out there now and the things you can do and, and how you can do them. And so I'm really pleased today to have uh, Deborah Wilbrink here. Um, she will be talking today. Uh, in uh, June, we'll have, <laughs> we'll have Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, yeah, I know, Elizabeth Taylor. I thought she was gone. Of course, I don't get out much, you know. Um, uh, she'll be talking about uh, the Camp Forest down in Tullahoma during the war. Um, I, uh, yeah, so that'll be fun. So, but today we have uh, Deborah Wilbrink. Um, she is a personal historian, someone who helps others preserve and pass down their family history in the form of stories, which is really interesting. She specializes in books and has helped over 20 families write their story for children and grandchildren. Deborah is a graduate of the Henry W. Grady School of Journalism, uh, University of Georgia, has been an English teacher, a video producer, <laughs> and a cemetery manager. And I, I really got we gotta talk about that one. Um, she is the author of Fire of Commitment, the history of the first Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville, and of the nonfiction book, Time to Tell, your personal and family history, and she'll be speaking about that today. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to Deborah Wilbur. Thank you, Ken, and also uh, Kelly for putting this together, and each of you for caring enough about your personal and family history to come today. Really appreciate it. So I know that this month is also uh, Family History Month, and it's got Mother's Day in it. So you'll be hearing some stories from Tennesseans about their mothers, which are collected in my book, Time to Tell Your Personal and Family History. How did I come to write Time to Tell? I'll let you in on a few secrets. And this is directly from the book I'll be reading from my book today. Adoption is sometimes a secret, sometimes a mystery a snapping of the branch of the family tree. Mabel Steely was torn from her birth family during America's Great Depression, and she remembers it all. The story is familiar to her children, but she wanted to share it more widely. An adult show and tell at her independent living community became an opportunity to share the story. It's important to tell it now, she whispered to me, because my children want me to write a book. I've started two or three times, but I've procrastinated. From her oxygen-equipped wheelchair, she added, I have COPD now. It's time to tell. With that, I arranged to come back and get Mabel's story, and it's included in here. It's a little bit different from most memoirs that I write or help people write because it's third person, and she wanted it told third person. When I went home that night, that was a, a few years back, and I, I went home and I thought about it, what Mabel had said, that it's time to tell. And it's so true, a lot of people I meet, they say, oh really, I wish I had done this with my parents. But I tell them, it's not just your parents, but you. You have your memories for your family, and you also have what you know about your parents that will be gone forever. So go ahead and tell it now. But I wrote a song that night, it's called Time to Tell. And after I wrote that song, thinking about Mabel and about all the adults who have to downsize and leave things behind and, and keep their secrets hidden for most of their lives sometimes, um, I started thinking that I had some ideas for other songs about personal and family history. So I ended up recording a CD and it's called Time to Tell as well. And Eventually, it ended up looking a lot like a little book instead of a CD. So this is the CD of six songs. While I was producing that and recording it, or helping to produce, my producer said to me, please write a book. Take these songs and all, all the stuff that you know from helping other people since 2011 and write a book. So I didn't want to because I said, you know, it's going to take a year. You don't understand how long it takes to write a book. And they were going, yeah, 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 you can do it, you can do it. So I did, and I matched a chapter to each of the songs. 
So in each chapter, you'll find a song and then tips about how to capture your personal and family history and then stories from Tennesseans that illustrate those tips. So the first story in the book and the chapter time to tell is called Appreciate the Mountaintops and it's about Mabel Steely. The four girls were playing in the yard when a big black car pulled to a stop. You kids want to go for a ride? Asked the smiling woman in the fashionable hat. Yes, ma'am, answered the oldest, five-year-old Mabel. It was 1935 and a car was a rarity. The nice lady helped them in the car and soon they were driving away. The girls would never return, never again see their mother. Their first stop was a boarding house. All the women here have big stomachs, thought Mabel. She noticed that when one with a big stomach would leave, another one would come in and the stomach would progress a little bit and get bigger. A photographer came to the house and took the girl's picture. The child would be grown before she saw that photo, an advertisement for adoption in the Memphis Press Scimitar. In it, the four girls had fake last names to speed their adoption, for no one would want to adopt just one, and no one would adopt four. It was Georgia Tan driving the big car. She popularized adoption, helping to set its rules, and she became rich as a result. The fat young women would leave much slimmer, leaving their illegitimate babies in Tan's care. But woe to the baby who sickened or was unattractive. Memphis had the highest infant mortality rate in the country due in large part to the many babies buried on Tan's properties. Some of these deaths never reported. Healthy orphans or stolen children were sometimes marketed for adoption. So I go on and tell the story which really has a happy ending because um, Mabel went on to become uh, a wife, a mother, a journalist, she hosted a very popular radio show in Clarksville, and she ended up being um, our, an equivalent to a uh, city county councilman. They have a different name for it there, but she was the first woman to hold that office, and she helped guide the city through their big tornado. So I was really pleased to meet um, Mabel and help her with that. One of the tips I learned from working with her, and that's illustrated by her story, is that a shared secret may be helpful to others. Carrying a family secret to your grave deprives people from learning secondhand through story. Many times the secret is not as bad as you fear. Times and standards change, and the very act of secrecy adds imagined weight to the bare facts. I have heard at least one secret that if it had been told and shared at the right time, it might have prevented a suicide. So there are things to do with your secrets. Another of the 15, 16, 17 tips just in this chapter are choose a listener who is slow to judge. If you are recording or the one recording, when you write through the hard stuff, be sure your listener or first reader is trusted and tolerant. If it is your turn to listen when you hear of a rape, a hidden disability, suicide, infidelity, bankruptcy, ch addiction, the many downturns of life's wheel, be a good listener. Leave judgment aside. Also in this chapter, I talk about cleaning out your sentimental closet. The blue embroidered garter that Grandma wore on her wedding day is easy to keep. But what about her faded and discolored hall mirror? That mirror reflected many happy times and hopes for generations, but no one wants to look at it now. Great Grandpa's tools have hung in that barn as long as the family can remember. There are better tools for the jobs now. And the family thinks these really belong in a museum or a living history village. When an older person is ready to move to a more appropriate location, few can take everything of sentimental value with them. Downsizing doesn't just happen to companies, it happens to people's possessions. The object itself may or may not have monetary value, 
but you can bet it has sentimental substance. How can one leave this behind? How can you help an elder downsize? And then I have some instructions what to do with these things. And one thing you can do, of course, is photograph them, take notes, make a beautiful photo book. That's one suggestion. As I thought about Mabel and all the other people that have to downsize and move maybe into one or two rooms with all of their goods and belongings left behind and their secrets, this, as I said, I went home and wrote a song that night. So I'm only going to play the chorus. And it's called Time to Tell. There's a skeleton in my closet Hear the rattle of its bones Thought I had lost it Leaving well enough alone I won't be here long this is my swan song, time to tell what went right and wrong. It's time to tell, it's time to tell, it's time, time to tell. <laughs> Thank you. What a good audience. So that's the first chapter in my book, and then I'm going to move along to something that's even more fun, the Family Fun Project. How can you make this fun and do it with your family? Go ahead and ask the people you're working with or interviewing, what do you do for fun? It might be gardening. It might be a hobby of some kind, like woodworking. It might be quilting. And then sometimes we have to learn things that we don't want to learn that aren't fun to learn. So for me, I kind of developed a, an excitement about graphic design. When I became a personal historian, I worked with the everyday people and the budgets are not very high. And rather than hire a graphic designer, I went to Watkins at night here and came away with some rudimentary skills, which I've developed through using the internet and, and the free classes on there and the YouTube videos. And so I was able to design my book. So I just want to kind of show you some of the illustrations. You can see it, of course, much closer up here. But um, I really am proud of the design. And I always help my clients with the design unless they want to hire someone else. So that's something I had to learn. <clears throat> so how did I conceive of the actual design theme? is in my book. You're reading an example of combining art, music, and literature in a book. Driving back from the Lawson family reunion, my husband and I passed through Morristown, Tennessee and decided to stop. We found a lovely craft center hosting the annual quilt show of the Rose Center Quilt Guild. Could we collaborate? Now elements from those lovely quilts, like the rosebud on some of the pages, are part of Time to Tell. I also love music, sometimes writing songs. This book for you contains all three. So when I work with a person, I encourage them to have fun and be creative. And there's a lot of creativity. Every project that I work with is different and unique. And, um, I would like to read from one of them. This is from Patsy Lawson. It was her family reunion. I was going to her and her husband, Herman. It's from a story called Mama and Contest. And they are from East Tennessee, but they live in Henderson now, Hendersonville. Mama was the second born of 10 children. Aunt Ruby came first, a whole two years before Mama. According to Alfred Adler, the early psychologist and friend of Sigmund Freud, this birth order played a key role in both Mama's and Aunt Ruby's personalities and their relationship to each other for the rest of their lives. Adler said that the birth order in a family determines the personality of each sibling, and it especially determines the personality of the sibling that follows next in line. In other words, you could expect Mama to be the exact opposite of Aunt Ruby. 
because she was second in line after Aunt Ruby, and she was. She was opposite in every way. The only things these two women seemed to share in common were their love for farming and quilting and their dedication to a life lived out one mile from the place of their births. Their practices of farming, quilting, and the living of life were polar opposites. These ladies competed in their quilting and they competed in their baking and Patsy's story continues. She tells about how she was forced to enter the 4-H baking contest, but her mother would actually do the baking and uh, she's a pretty good storyteller. Now, <clears throat> every quilt is different, an original work of art shaped by color, pattern, and textiles, ultimately created by designer and quilter. Each personal or family history is different, shaped by circumstances and character, geography, and culture, ultimately taking its shape from the writer. Author Leonard Goodwin chose to write a spiritual autobiography in blank verse, Echoes in the Universe, a spiritual memoir, detailing a life of study, research, and teaching of the social sciences. The blank verse forms the structure for the many different patterns and colors of his life. But Mary Mallon, author of Stops Along the Way, included her poems in her personal memoir, and they rhyme. Her structure for this was the theme of travel, both personally and in a travel industry career. These two poems by very different personal history authors we call exciting childhood memories. So interesting to readers of a different generation and so important to the foundational backing of every quilt of life. They tell important stories. So Leonard's poem that is in here, The Coming of the 36 Dodge, as I said, his whole biography or autobiography is done in blank verse. But this is about his father taking Leonard and his sister for their first ride in their first car, the 1936 Dodge. They lived in Brooklyn at the time, and the father was a rocket scientist, but he couldn't quite manage the clutch. So um, it's about his father learning to drive in Brooklyn the first day he gets the car. Then Mary's, Mary spent some time, she was always on the road it seemed like, and that's why her book is called Stops Along the Way. But she spent some time on a grandparent's farm with a cousin, and this story um, really exemplifies her, I call her the cheerful traveler. She is just so br bright and happy. So the name of the poem is called Bouncing, and I hope you enjoy it. It's by Mary Purdy Mallon, who lives in Nashville. I'll bet I can bounce higher than you. Sit there and watch me while I do a few. On this feather bed at Grandpa's homestead, 100 years old, or so it is said, your bouncing is up when mine is down. We laugh like hyenas when no one's around. Today we pumped water out of the well. We used the wood privy. We rang the lunch bell. Now we are bouncing as high as the sky, pledging our friendship until we both die. Our lives will keep jumping under attack, but whatever happens, we'll always bounce back. So I love her attitude. So one thing I stress in this book and, and the people I work with is creativity. So Patsy and Herman Lawson, whom story I read a little bit to you, uh, they wrote this song with me and we used images from our lives to write Grandma's Quilt and I'm going to play just um, the chorus and one verse from that for you. And if y'all had not clapped before, I wouldn't be playing this now. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> It all comes back now as I rest beneath Grandma's quill, Grandma's quilt, a patchwork of memory, soft upon my skin. Love and touch of family 
Papa's tobacco pouch and homemade wedding dress. Lace christening gown, baby Dan wore to be blessed. Red satin ribbon sashayed round Patsy's prom. Star of jungle green from Billy's tour in Vietnam. When all comes back now, as I rest beneath Grandma's quilt. Thank you. Time to Tell is written to be useful to the average person. You'll see a lot of books in your library here about writing memoir, and most of them are for literary writers. They're very, um, they're very literate, and I love it. But my own background actually comes from writing television commercials. <laughs> so I have a very different outlook. and. Most people can understand my book. I've had several people call me up and say, I couldn't put it down, I read it all. You know, I read it during the night, I'm done with it. And I love that, that they could finish it. It's a small book. And I also included questions in the back if you wanted to do it with a group. And I'll give group rates too if anybody's interested later, talk to me. But you could have a little, you know, your book club read this and discuss it very easily. And before they know it, they might be writing their own. So, the first person that I worked with was 98-year-old Thad Martin. His book, That's the Gist of It, taught me that the everyday person does lead a unique and interesting life. Thad's mother was very important to him and she encouraged his schooling. So I'm going to read a little bit from his book. This one is, this part is from my own book. Thaddeus Martin lived in two centuries. He struggled to lift an ax to begin his first childhood job, picked tobacco, was whipped in school, and killed hogs. In his rural Tennessee homeland, Thad drove the first car, which made him very popular with the ladies. He was the expert on radio and installed the first electric lines after having convinced people they needed electricity. Later, he equipped mighty ships for war. Thad was handy with machines, and objects changed his life. He told us some of the first machines he saw, a bicycle, and later, he saw a barnstormer's biplane, which fed his natural curiosity. Thad finished all the schooling available in his area. He wanted more, and his mother single-handedly made sure of it they would have to move from the family farm. At his new school, Thad won a scholastic award from the vocational program, which he kept as a treasure all his life. And I uh, don't know if you can see that, but his medal is pictured in here that he got from his high school. So from his story, how to finish high school, Central High School in Murfreesboro, 1931 to 1933, I made a footstool and gave it to mother. Didn't nobody ever make one like that. It's solid walnut. That piece of material it's covered with is probably 200 years old. I don't know what it was, but my mother had that before I was born, and the first time I covered the stool, she wouldn't let me cut the material up so I could get its pattern centered. But after she died, I cut it up and put it where it belonged, in the center. Nobody in the school made one like this. I had to draw the blueprint, put the dimensions on that, and make it by the dimensions. Mother kept it. The footstool moved around with it. So we photographed the footstool and also put that in the book. Some of the tips that are illustrated in Thad's story and the other stories in here are how objects, curios, and mementos hold special power to help us recall the past. Do you remember the game Show and Tell? 
when you were kids? You can use this concept to generate some great stories. Use it to help you record your own memories. Use it at a party, a family reunion, a dinner, or simply on a visit, and you'll learn more about your family history. You ask your guests to bring an object or photo from the past. Some may bring a document, a letter, maybe even an award. Take turns sharing stories about the things you brought. These are great conversation pieces, icebreakers, and a way to hear new family stories. Another tip, if you are working with a show and tell, say at Thanksgiving dinner, maybe before the football game, some folks are so thrilled with the significance of their personal treasure that they forget to explain it. They'll just hold it up there. Allow some questions, but not an interrogation. How did it arrive? What makes it significant? Why is this still kept and treasured? With a little thoughtful digging, the object can bring back memories that seemed lost forever. With yesterday's treasures, explain any differences in the past for listeners and readers who may be much younger. That will make it a real journey into the past. To confirm that, I'm going to play you a brief song. Just the chorus of one called uh, Yesterday's Trash. <clears throat> Yesterday is trash, today's treasure, leftover life from a different era. Look, see a ghost, fingerprints clinging. Listen, hear echoes of history ringing. Yesterday's trash. Today's treasure, hold the past, take its measure, bring back memories lost forever. With yesterday's trash, today's treasure. Thank you. <laughs> So I try to make my message interesting, you know, and one that you'll remember. You may remember music more or a piece of art more than all the words that I'm saying today. So the message is, of course, to tell your story as soon as possible and record it and get those of your family down. Now, as you, how many of you uh, want to tell your own story but we'll also be working with family members. A few of you, okay. Anybody just working with family story? Anybody thinking about it? Okay, there's some thinkers here, that's good. Because what you're gonna face is objections. They might be internal, they might be external. And because of that, and I'm very familiar with every objection since I help people come to the conclusion that they need me and my services, the objections are listed in here, and one of them I'll address with you. I'm not a good storyteller. I'm not a good writer. Well, you don't have to be because you're the expert on your life. Isn't it great to be the expert? There's nobody who knows more about it than you do. With an interested listener asking questions and recording answers, there's soon enough material for an edited personal history. Even a small book or short recording can hold information that will be valued for generations. And we're right in the right place for that, right? The library and the archives to know of the value of that. You can connect with the help of others, not only to your past, but to your present family and friends. Connecting is a journey through time, across generations, across distances, stepping carefully onto the heart bridge. My mother, Carol Schnook Spots, lives 2,000 miles away in Mesa, Arizona. 
She reached out to me and we spent a vacation weekend together at a lovely hotel near her home. Mom has always written poetry for special occasions and enjoyed sending cards, sometimes with her little poems tucked inside. Could we write a song together? Remember I said, let's have some fun with your family, something different? So I thought about that. If mother's a poet and I'm a songwriter, why don't we try it? While I was down the hall at the hotel's business center taking care of my plane reservation, mom finished most of our lyrics. Hardbridge is our song, reminding us to reach out, to connect to our family, to our heritage, to our roots. When it's time to tell, meet someone halfway. Like many personal historians, my first project was one for my family, the Schnook book. That's about my mother's family. It has direct stories from four generations of mother's family, and a few more about the folks further back in our family history, stories that were told and remembered. It makes a wonderful showpiece sample, and all the aunts, uncles, and cousins have copies. For my father, I'm working on the story of the Eatons, my maiden name. Who waits for you at the far end of the heart bridge? So think about that. Again, um, if you buy just, if I can go ahead and promote my book, um, Time to Tell is $18.95 online or at bookstores, but you can get one today at a lower cost. You can buy just the book, which comes with download codes, or the book and CD, or just the CD. And I also uh, would like to suggest that if you want to talk to me about your personal history project, please fill out a little card with a way to get in touch with you. But right now, if you have any questions for me about the book itself or the process of writing the book, um, what would you like to know? Yes, sir. Are you related to Harville Eaton? Who? Harville, H-A-R-V-I-L-E, Eaton. Not that I know. He's the president of Cumberland University. Oh, I would love to know more about that. Yeah, our Eatons um, go to, back to Kansas, and farther than that, I haven't studied. Uh, yeah, haven't he, done dad's side yet. He was a, a, what, a friend of mine, and uh, my name is Bob Allen, and what I do is... Uh, can I, 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 I read the microphone, Bob? Okay. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Bob Allen, and I uh, lead a Bellevue history and genealogy group. We met every Friday now for 11 years with a different speaker. And number one, I'd like to invite you to be a speaker. Uh, we are committed through uh, the end of this season, but we will start up again in August. And I also lead a uh, memoirs uh, writing, telling your story group, and I've written a book myself about this. And I certainly uh, want to emphasize all the things you said about that, so, uh, and um, I'm a book publisher, and if you ever need help with anything like that. What happened today for me is really good, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, and don't get out of here. Avert, don't let him get out of here without getting his name and number. Thank you. Uh, you had a question back there? Yeah, uh, I'm interested in, in uh, let's say if a person, like, let's say that a person uh, can't write, or hesitates to write, or what they write has very little of their story in it, actually. And so it's important, you know, often for the person to, to talk and ask questions, and then you take notes. And then. So I was interested in that process uh, of how that works. You know, for example, you pick up uh, metaphors, figures of speech from them, and expand. In other words, to what extent does the product become your work and to what extent is it what comes out of their mouth? Great question and um, I think my style is a little different because I come from a journalistic background rather than literary. Um, so I always try to keep the voice of the person telling the story exactly what they say. Like um, Mr. Martin, Thad was a little shocked when he read our draft and he said I thought you would correct all my grammar and words and I said well that really wouldn't be you, Thad, and I was able to keep it in there. One technique that I'll give you uh, a little tip on, if you're having trouble getting them 
to write down anything. Of course, you can record it so easily on your phone. I'm using an iPad now to record. But if you just let them talk, even if they seem like they're wandering, don't interrupt. That's what I found. Wait until the end of the story. Make some notes yourself of the questions. And you'll find that if a guy or girl has a good listener, they're not going to shut up. <laughs> That's what I find anyway. Okay. Thanks so much for your question. Anybody else? Uh, just two, uh, two quick ones. These are sort of related. Uh, when was the book Time to Tell released? And also, is this your first book? Thank you. I released two books in the same year, 2016. Yeah, and so that was um, this past year. I did the CD the year before and had it ready for the end of 2015. And um, the church history that I wrote took four years to write. And that was kind of a labor of love. But uh, I've also published many more. And I do want to remind you all, too, that... Um, whether you would like to come or tell some of your friends and family to come, is that May 29th, I will be back here for a workshop in the archives. And um, you can find that on the website. Um, somehow I'm forgetting the exact times. Ken, do you know? Oh yeah, 9.30 in the morning till 12.30. So that's probably a Saturday. Yeah, so, um, and it's free. You can call here or see Ken to register. And I um, appreciate that. And, and that's a three-hour workshop, whereas I go into different writing techniques more, and it, I have a PowerPoint to illustrate that as well. Okay? And I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. I have one more. Uh, Introduce yourself again, please. Oh, okay. Uh, my, my name is Walter Berman, and I live in Houston, actually. I'm visiting my son here. And I, I know, as a result of uh, talking with him, uh, that we have somewhat different memories. <laughs> so my question is, is this, let's say that a person's story uh, is somewhat subjective, maybe. You know, we're all subjective. And that, that's what I'm getting at. A, a few of the facts may not be facts, but my sense is that it's important that those memories have uh, deep grooves and they've been there a long, long time and they become factual for that person. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah. So, that, for example, if another member of the family reads the story, might say, oh, well, no, this, this, I don't think this is the right. You know, I have a different memory, or I have a different sense of this. You see what I'm getting at? My, my sense that, that the, the actual facts, in some ways, are not as important as the subjective memories. I would agree with you. <laughs> so, you know, if a fact is related to a historical event, I always check that. You know, they may say, oh, the Great War, and it might actually be the Korean War or something like that. So it can get a little mixed up. But your memories are your memories, and if people are sincere in telling them, I, re I do write those as they are. And that's always a subject of debate, always a question that comes up when you're working with personal history. What is the truth? And uh, the genealogists maybe have a little bit different perspective on that because if you read a genealogy book, it's footnoted completely all the way through. Very scary to me. <laughs> so I like working with the stories. And that's what they are. And you can always say, it has been said that, or I have heard that. And another point I like to make, but I, I think I should save these points for, you can read them in the book or you can get them at the workshop, but I won't stop here because you don't want to be mean in your memoirs. You always give somebody an out if you can, or you're going to look like the mean one. And you don't want to look bad in your own story. OK. And I would like to wrap that up. Ken, did you have uh, yeah, you want well, to? One, just a comment, really. I, I really like the way that you. Would you um, like to go ahead and use okay. the microphone? Yeah, all right. Um, I really like the way that you present this as far as uh, not being judgmental. And you're telling, you know, people are telling a personal narrative. So it may or may not coincide exactly with the facts, but it's their personal view of that. And I like that, and I like the way you're talking about that. Just let them roll. Don't judge what they're saying. Um, at different times, people say different things, and they think in different ways. And so, you know, from, from an archive's perspective, you know, we, we can take care of the minute book, the will book, the marriage book, 
but the stories around that are, are what's getting away. And so that is something we really, really need to do is um, record your own memories, especially those of an older generation, and get that down, get the family memories down. So I really like this, and I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, the workshop coming up on January 29th. Uh, anyway, so I'm still behind. I'm on May, May 29th okay. is a Saturday. And um, so May 29, be sure and be there. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for people to come and, and get those stories down. Because you know, everybody's got, everyone remembers some older person in the family that's gone and they don't remember the stories. And so it's, it's very important to get this down. And from an archival standpoint, we can, it, it, the, the record is so much more uh, vibrant. You know, it's not dry words on a page. These are people that actually lived and did things. And so that's the thing we need to keep and understand. So that was my comment. <laughs> Good point. Thank yeah. you. And I would just like to throw in for the sake of us archivists and historians that we get the history story of what happened often from the top down. And you might have a different perspective and your older relatives might have a different perspective. And it's really important to get that because they're going to tell you something you never heard. I have heard so many new things from older people, and I do read a lot, but I've heard new things from the average person, um, lots of things. So I do hope that you will stay and buy a copy of the book and let me sign it for you or for your mother or for someone else in the family. Thank you. Well, I want to... I want to thank Deborah again for being here today and sharing this with us. Uh, be sure to remember May 29, it's on a Saturday. It'll be in the West Reading Room of the Archives. It's just down the hall. And so West Reading Room, third floor, main public library, the archives, and she'll have a workshop on this thing, Time to Tell. So with that, remember we have uh, in June, the uh, next one coming up will be uh, on um, Camp Forest down in Tullahoma. There's a book out about that. Elizabeth Taylor will be with us. And so I invite you back for that. And thank you for being here today. And thank you for watching. Thanks. Cool.